you have your Bible with you, which I trust you do, please open it to Acts chapter 22. Acts 22, as we continue through our study of the book of Acts, we come to verses 17 through 29 this morning, and we'll see this morning Paul's post-conversion commission. Uh, Last week we saw him give his testimony before those who were trying to kill him, and uh, now this morning we will see his testimony of what God commissioned him to do after his conversion. Christians are often accused of not really caring about the lost or even accused of having a holier-than-thou attitude. Sadly, many times, this can be and is a true characterization of many who profess to be Christians. We can tend to think that we are above or better than those who are currently walking in darkness, forgetting that we were once walking in that same darkness and that we didn't come out of it on our own. We only came out of it by God's grace of Him transferring us from darkness and into the great light of Christ. We were children of wrath just as the rest. And if we can remember that those words from Romans chapter 3 ring true of us, that we that, that there was no fear of God before our eyes, that we were not seeking after God, we did not understand. There were none, not even us, who did good, Romans says, not even one. And if we can remember that and keep that at the forefront of our mind, I think this would be a protection of us, for us from looking down upon others who are still walking in darkness. Because often, many times, many professing Christians may find themselves thinking that someone because their sin is so great, uh, thinking of them as being unsavable, as if they can't be reached. We might find ourselves unwilling to have contact with the prostitute, or the drug abuser, or the Muslim, or the Hindu, or others that, that, that... professing Christians may consider to be undesirable. You know, and I know that many times that we're, it's not as if our circle of friends and our acquaintances are are prostitutes and, and, and drug dealers, but you know, but we do have contact with them many times. We, they, they do cross our paths. Maybe when we go into a grocery store or we go into a a, a fast food restaurant, and we and we see some that appear to be clearly um, walking in a world of darkness, and sometimes we tend to kind of distance ourselves or not make eye contact because we don't want to speak to them. Now, I mean, we we do these things, and we love the gospel, and we want everyone to be saved, but sometimes. We can fall into that trap of wanting everyone to be saved that we consider to be worthy. Wanting everyone who's like us to be saved. And when we do sometimes quote, lower ourselves, because we can become prideful, because we forget who we once were, to speak to those that we consider to be unworthy, then we can tend to do so in an unloving way. You know, we may have friends that are that are encompassed in a life of drunkenness and sexual sin. And we want them to be saved, but we take their sin first 
and say, you've got to stop doing this. You've got to stop living this way. You've got to stop acting this way. Well, they don't want to stop acting that way. They're lost. And lost people are going to do what lost people do, which is sin. Rather than approaching with the grace of the gospel and telling them about Christ and the salvation that He offers and allowing the Holy Spirit to work, and open their eyes to the sinfulness of sin. I know that's what it took for me. My family could tell me how my lifestyle was so ungodly and how I had to change. Well, that didn't draw me to want to change. As a teenager or as a lost person in my early 20s, the only thing that could make me want to change was the revelation of Christ and His cross to me through the Gospel and Him opening my eyes to seeing that that my life, my sin, is what put Him on the cross. And then to desire not to want to offend Him or live in a way that would be unpleasing to him. That my that, that and it's only the the spirit that can make our love for Christ greater than our love for pleasing ourselves. The world is consumed in darkness. The world is lonely and and lost and without Christ. And many times their sin is a means of attempting to fill a void that they have in their lives. Many times they're drowning out reality with alcohol. They don't want to turn to Christ. They love the feeling that the, that the drunkenness brings them because it just distances them from, for a period of time from their world, from, from the realities of their life. Sexual sin, because just self-pleasure and self-gratification is being sought, and they're not finding, they can't imagine finding their joy and their satisfaction in Christ, that He is, as we've saying, He is all we have. That He is everything to us, and recognizing that that gift of sex is a is a gift that God has given to be enjoyed between husband and wife man and woman husband and wife and unfortunately the type of christian that is this holier than thou attitude that we just mentioned gives all christians a bad name Because when someone looks upon and sees these type of Christians, well, they kind of lump all of Christianity together and think that that's, well, then that's what it is to be a Christian, to be judgy, judging the world. Now, we're we're not, we, we are condemned from judging the world. Paul says, don't judge those who are outside of the body of Christ. When Christ returns, He'll judge them. We as Christians are to judge each other, meaning we don't condemn one another, but we hold one another accountable. And we go to one another in, you know, in, in love. Um, and so unfortunately, they can tend to give all Christians a bad name. Christians can have the reputation... Um, of being uh, brow beaters and Bible thumpers and and forcing Bible verses down the throats of the lost in an unloving and an uncaring way. More concerned about behavior modification than leading a lost world and lost friends to a genuine saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Lost people do what they do, as we mentioned, get drunk, uh, reprobate sexual lifestyles, use filthy language, tell lies. They do this because they're lost. Lost people act like they're lost 
because they are. Our motive is not behavior modification. The answer for any sinner is not to just to stop what they're doing, but the answer is to turn to Christ, to trust in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And when He saves someone, He gives them His Spirit and causes them to walk in His way to desire to walk in His ways. Behavior modification cannot do that. And we can't reverse the order. It's not behavior modification and then we make ourselves clean enough that God will save us. It is Christ and salvation. And He gives us His Spirit and He cleanses our lives. We can't reverse the order. Paul had a genuine love for the lost. Paul loved the lost of Israel so much that he said he could wish himself accursed for their salvation. It's out of that love that Paul had for the lost that even while they wanted and tried to kill him, that he just wants to give them the gospel and point them to Jesus. It's what we see, what we've been seeing in these passages that we've been in. That those who want to kill Him, and they've tried to kill Him, He just wants to point them to Christ. He just wants them to be saved. He doesn't say to them, you've got to stop trying to kill people. I mean, that's a good idea for anyone to do. If you're trying to kill people, you should stop. But His point isn't, stop trying to kill me. His point is, turn to Christ. Believe upon Christ for the salvation of your sins. After Paul's third missionary journey, he arrives in Jerusalem. And he was determined to get there before Pentecost. Paul's ministry over the previous 25 years, more or less, had been successful. It was successful in bringing many to faith in Christ and bringing many sons to glory, but it was also successful in alienating a whole world of religious and unbelieving Jews. Everywhere he went, people believed, but he was also run out of town, sometimes beaten, stoned, or imprisoned. He'd been to many different regions. He'd been to Galatia, Achaia, Phrygia, Macedonia, Asia. He'd planted many churches. And now many of these same Jews that he had angered in these other regions, these same Jews that had persecuted him while he was there preaching the gospel, now they were all gathered in Jerusalem for the Jewish festival of Pentecost. So they had all come together in Jerusalem. They'd made many false accusations against Paul, saying that he had no regard for the law, that he had no regard for the Jews themselves, for the people of Israel, or that he had no regard for the temple. They'd even accused him of defiling the temple by bringing a Gentile into the temple court. And these were all lies. And Paul was doing all that he could to prove that he was not anti-Jewish. He was not anti-Semitic. He was even going through his own ceremonial purification and participating in the ceremonial purification of four other men. And so as he's doing this and he's come to the temple, well, the Jews who were there, these Jews, that uh, many of them that he had angered in these other areas that he had gone and preached the gospel to, that had come to Jerusalem, they instigate a riot. This is the man who's preaching against the law. They instigate a riot and they're trying to beat Paul to death. The Romans break it up and put Paul in chains. Paul 
surprises the commander whose name, according to uh, chapter 23, verse 26, is Claudius Lysias. By speaking to him in Greek, and he's Claudius Lysias is surprised at this, and he he and then Paul asks, "Well, I want to address the crowd. I want to address these people who 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 you just rescued me from, who were trying to beat me to death. I want to address them." Well, his request is granted, and he then addresses them, but. Not in Greek, he addresses them in Hebrew or Jewish Aramaic, which was the common language of the Jews. And they, they listen carefully as Paul bears witness to the authenticity of his Jewishness and his zeal for God and, and for the law and uh, his persecuting and imprisoning of, of followers of Jesus. And so he finds common ground um, and he underlines the fact here that he was not always a believer in Christ, that he once hated believers, thinking that this will, will help them to listen to him. He then tells them, as he after he establishes his, his credentials as being a true Jew, he then tells them how he was converted. He tells them of his Jewish ethnicity, but then he tells them how he's converted and become a, a follower and a believer of Christ when the risen Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Paul attests to the Jewish ethnicity of Jesus, that he is Jesus the Nazarene from a, 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 a city of Israel. He attests to the deity of Christ and to the truth of the resurrection. So Paul is, is giving them the gospel. And so they listened to Paul up to a point. But when Paul's words implied that God was interested in saving people different than them, when Paul's words implied that God wasn't just about saving the Jews, He was going to save those filthy Gentiles as well. They weren't willing to listen anymore. He was un when, when he told them that God was going to save those and sent Paul to preach the gospel to those who in the perspective of the Jews were unclean, well then, they want to finish what they had just started. They want to now they want to finish the task of killing Paul. And so these verses and verses 17 through 29, we have these points that we'll see here. Verses 17 through 21, we'll see Paul's commission. We'll see what Christ says to him and has appointed him to do as his servant. And then we'll see in the next couple of verses, Christ rejected. And then lastly, we'll see Paul interrogated. And so let's read our verses this morning. And we'll begin. So Paul had just given the testimony of his salvation and Ananias coming to see him and telling him, then why do, why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins calling on the name of Christ. And verse 17 says, It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance and I saw Him, Jesus, saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So they listened to Paul up to this statement, and they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. How dare you say that God's going to save filthy Gentiles? You should be killed. 
And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, But I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put him in chains. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So, Paul, he's given his testimony of his conversion. In verses 14 through 16, we have the, uh, the, the end of Paul's conversion story. Uh, Ananias... Ananias uh, relates to Paul uh, that, that he had been chosen by God, that he had been appointed by God to uh, see the risen Lord and to hear His voice, that God had taken the initiative in drawing Paul to Himself and saving him. And so Ananias asked, What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on His name. It's not baptism that saves and wash away, washes away sins. It wasn't baptism that saved Paul. But it was by grace, through faith, that was exhibited by calling on the name of Jesus. Call, and, and so for Paul, it was very clear. He was now calling upon the name of the very one that he had been vehemently and violently opposed to. And so verse 17 indicates just that, that Paul had called on the name of Christ. So he speaks of the time when he returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple. So Paul, Paul writes about this visit to Jerusalem in, in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and following, and, and in his letter to the Galatians. Paul notes that this visit to Jerusalem that he speaks of here took place uh, three years after his conversion experience. So Paul had been saved, and after three years he returned to to Jerusalem. And that's uh, we're not going to go there to read it, but you can write it down. Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. Um, so three years after Paul was saved, he returned to Jerusalem. Paul had been preaching the gospel in Damascus and all over the uh, region of Syria for three years. And he then returns to Jerusalem uh, for the first time since leaving there with the letters in his hand from the high priest that permitted him to arrest uh, and, uh, Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem to be punished. And uh, so Paul returns there to Jerusalem three years later, uh, not with Christians to be persecuted, but he returns there now as a Christian. So this experience in the temple for his Jewish audience that he's speaking to, he's telling that this vision, this what I'm about to share with you, was in the temple, and to them this was holy ground. This was in the temple where God was. Paul says that he was in a trance. The, the Greek word here is... Um, ecstasis, which we get our word ecstasy. Paul is communicating. He was in a he was he was in a trance. He was praying. He was he was experiencing a divine high, a time in the life of the believer that is 
when he is in real communion with God. When we talked about this Wednesday night, that, that, that there's there as we try to cultivate lives that that God would 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 draw near to. It, the scripture tells us, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. Th- this was a time where Paul truly experienced that presence, uh, the, the experiential presence of, of God and felt that presence. It says, I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me, and the Lord Jesus spoke to him again. You know, he had previously spoken to him and appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And Jesus speaks to him again and told him, Get out of Jerusalem. They will not accept your testimony about me. Well, Paul had been obedient to to the vision that he had received on the road to Damascus and immediately began preaching and proclaiming Christ as Israel's long-awaited Messiah. And so then, after three years of of obedience and proclaiming Christ there, uh, he returns to Jerusalem and likely had contacts with some of his former teachers, some of his former fellow students that he was with previously, pre-conversion. This is the first time that he's seeing them since he left there with letters to go and persecute Christians. And they've heard the rumors of Paul preaching Christ. And now Paul's coming back to Jerusalem for the first time. Can you imagine their rage toward him? He changed sides. He'd abandoned them. He was a traitor. And so their rage toward him was possibly and probably the reason why Jesus told him to leave quickly. Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly. They're not going to tolerate you here. And this is consistent with Paul's statement in Galatians chapter 1. So verse 18, beginning at verse 18, it says, Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem. So three years after his conversion, he returns to Jerusalem to become acquainted with with Cephas, Peter, and stayed with him fifteen days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea who were in Christ, but only they kept hearing He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. And then it also correlates with the information that is given in Acts chapter 9. Now we mentioned this passage earlier. When Paul uh, came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. So Paul returns to Jerusalem to a very dangerous situation. The Jews, the religious Jews, hated him because he was a traitor. The Christians weren't sure if he was really converted or not, so they feared him. And so Paul returns there and he noted that that Jesus told him, leave, leave Jerusalem quickly. They will not listen to your testimony here. And so in response to Jesus' command to to leave quickly, to make haste, Paul protested. Paul mistakenly thought that he would be received well in Jerusalem. Paul's response appealed to common sense 
and reason. But when it comes to religious zeal, when it comes to those who believe that they're followers of God and are steeped in tradition, common sense and reason have left the building. They're not thinking clearly. So Paul thought naively that they'll see what a difference, you know, Lord, that you have made in my life. And therefore, they'll desire the same kind of relationship that I have with you. They'll, they'll, Lord, they know all the things that I used to do. They know that I was beating those who believed in you and approving of Stephen's bloody murder. They'll see the difference that you've made in my life, and they'll turn to you as well. I can be an effective witness for you here, Lord. Well, they wouldn't, when, when Jesus was walking the earth, they wouldn't listen to Jesus. Even after Jesus had performed miracle after miracle after miracle that they had seen and witnessed with their own eyes, they still would not turn to Him. And so, Jesus says, they will not listen to you. Make haste and leave Jerusalem. When those who are blinded by their own uh, tradition, when they're blinded by their own greed and, and lust for power, when they come face to face with the truth, when the light of Christ shines into their darkness and exposes them for who they are, their response is not to embrace this truth. Their response was not to embrace Paul. Oh, you're right, dear brother. Let us repent and believe upon Christ. Their response, their desire, when the light shines, is to extinguish the light. He must be killed. This light, this, no, we will not listen to this. The only, their, their desire is for what can make them feel better about themselves. And certainly, the light of the gospel was not accomplishing that for them. Admitting when someone is when, when when someone is in this state of darkness, still lost and walking in darkness, and they're steeped in the tradition of their religion, admitting that they've been wrong, admitting that they've been deceiving themselves, is off the table. They must stamp out the light. Why? Because they hate it. They hate the light. They're like cockroaches. You know, a house that's infested with cockroaches, when all the lights are out, where are they? Everywhere. They're just out running freely, aren't they? But then what happens when you flip on the lights? Yeah, they scatter. They scurry. They, where do they make a run to? Back to where it's dark. They can't stand the light. Jesus told about this in John chapter 3, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed.
they must stamp out the light. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't stand this teaching and this truth that Paul brought. In verse 21, the vision ends with Jesus directing Paul again to get out of Jerusalem. They won't listen to you here. And that He is sending, the, sending Him to proclaim the good news to the Gentiles. Go! Now, could God have protected Paul in Jerusalem? Absolutely. It just wasn't God's will for Paul to be there. The, what God's will for Paul was to go away into Gentile lands, to other nations, and proclaim the gospel, fulfilling Jesus' great commission. Go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. And so this is where he was sending Paul. To all the Gentile nations, to the ends of the earth. This doesn't mean that Paul... Uh, would not proclaim the gospel to Jews as well. When he says, go to the Gentiles, he's saying, go to the Gentile lands. There were also synagogues of the Jews there, and so where did, where did Paul always go first? He went to where? He went to the Gentile lands, and he went and proclaimed the gospel to the Jews. He went to make disciples. And then those, who, those of the Jews who would believe, they become fellow witnesses with him in proclaiming the gospel to all who were there. He was going to the Gentile regions, proclaiming the gospel to Jews and Gentiles. Paul wanted them to know, when Paul's witness here, he wanted those who were persecuting him and trying to kill him to know that his proclamation of Jesus to the dispersed Jews in the Gentile lands and also to the Gentiles in all of these Gentile regions, this was a result of divine decree. This was God sending me. A decree that He had received from the Lord Himself in the very temple, in the very place where they were standing at that moment. This was the command of God given to me from here on holy ground. And so Paul receives his commission, continues his proclamation of Christ, and now we see him, see Christ rejected. Christ rejected. Now, was Paul rejected? Yes, but ultimately it was Christ that was rejected. They listened to Paul up until this point. They listened to him up until the point that when he makes the statement that Jesus, the crucified and risen Messiah, sent him to proclaim the gospel so that people different from them might be saved. So that the, those who they considered unclean would be saved as well. They listened to him up until that statement. That God wanted to save people who were not brought up under the law of Moses. And when they heard that, they'd, they'd had enough. They'd tolerated about as much of Paul as they were going to take. Making evident that Jesus' statement to Paul was true. Go, they won't listen to you here. For Paul to say that, Jesus was going to, and that God desired to save Gentiles as well as Jews, put Gentiles and Jews on the same level as sinners, equally unreconciled to God, impure, defiled, and in need of cleansing. This was not tolerable for them. So they shout again, away with such a fellow. Away with him from the earth. He should not even be allowed to live. And so they were removing their cloaks. They were taking off their outer garments, their robes, either in order to continue beating Him, to remove the long sleeves that might restrain their arms from swinging faster, or they were removing them as a gesture similar to that of shaking the dust off of one's feet 
in protest. They removed their cloaks and tossing dust in the air. This was an expression of uncontrolled rage. This was a violent mob that demanded blood. They hated Paul. They hated Paul's message. And his message of Christ, their hatred for that message was directed toward Paul. And so now we see him interrogated. They, the Jews want to kill him. And so then Claudius Lysias had him to be brought into the barracks. He didn't know what to think. Claudius Lysias didn't know what to think. Because evidently he didn't comprehend the Hebrew dialect and he didn't know what Paul had just said. And so he was going to interrogate him under torture. He had spoke, Remember, Paul had spoken to him in Greek, which surprised him. And now he turns around and, and is speaking to the Jews in Jewish Aramaic in their language. And Claudius Lysias doesn't know what he's saying. And so he wants to scourge Paul uh, with a whip, a flogging as was done to Jesus. He wanted to do this in order to extract information. He wanted to find out what this Jew had done that was worthy of execution. Well, many times, victims of this particular type of abuse and torture often died as a, as a result of it. Um, and if they didn't die, they, usually they were crippled for life. And so they prepared Paul's body for this torture, for this interrogation under torture. They stretched out Paul's body in a way in such to inflict as much pain as possible, stretching him forward so that the, all the skin is, is pulled tightly so that every blow of the flogging would bring as much pain as possible to him. He, they created this tense posture with his body so that the blows would do the maximum damage of, of, to the skin and ripping the flesh open. But... Claudius Lysias was about to be surprised again. Not only was he mistaken in thinking that Paul was a rabble-rousing Egyptian, he also errs in his belief that he is mere, he believes now Paul is just merely a Jew. So Paul asks the question calmly. And in a rhetorical manner, he insinuates uh, his Roman citizenship. He insinuates it rather than strongly asserting it. He does this to the centurion who is standing by. Is it, is it lawful? I'm just kind of curious here, Mr. Centurion. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who's a Roman and uncondemned? Why does he do this? Why does he calmly insinuate it rather than strongly assert it? Well, B.M. Uh, Rasky notes that uh, he does not, what Paul's doing, he doesn't want to undercut his religious commitment to Judaism before Roman eyes. And that he is still prepared to suffer and even to die if his insinuation, his implication is disregarded. He doesn't start crying out, you can't do this. He's calmly, calmly asserting it, or calmly in, in, in insinuating his Roman citizenship. Paul didn't disclose his Roman citizenship earlier because it would have harmed his testimony to the Jews that he was trying to reach with the gospel. Paul's concern was not his life. He's trying to reach the Jews with the gospel of Jesus Christ as, as Israel's Messiah. Had he declared his citizenship before them, then they, they how would they have responded? Well, they surely would have received... Paul's declaration of being a Roman as confirmation of their accusations that he teaches against the law, he teaches against the Jews, he teaches against the temple. Paul's concern was not his temporary comfort or even his life on this earth. 
but his concern was for the eternal state of the never dying souls. Yes, even of those who hated him. Even of those who were his enemy on this earth, who were trying to kill him. That was his only concern, was that they not be condemned to hell. He wanted them to know Christ. So, when the centurion heard this, he heard it. He went to the commander. He went to Claudius. Paul's citizen, his status as a citizen of Rome requires him to be treated differently than if he was merely a Jew. And so, when the centurion heard this from Paul, he went and re- reported this to Claudius Lysias, who notes that he had acquired his citizenship with a large sum of money indicating that he was likely from an affluent family even before he joined the Roman army. He was able to pay money and acquire his citizenship. Well, and often pledges uh, to Roman citizenship take on the name of their sponsor. And so his name indicated, Lysias indicated that he was a Greek, and he had become a sponsor, become a citizen during the reign and under the sponsorship of Emperor Claudius. And so as a Roman citizen, you know, bought his citizenship uh, into Rome as now joining the Roman army, he's able to uh, aspire to a higher rank. And he was in a very high-ranking position in the army by this purchased citizenship. Well, Paul's citizenship, however, was not purchased. Because I was actually born a citizen, meaning that this doesn't take away that mean that Paul wasn't Jewish. It means that Paul was a citizen, that he was a Jew that was born to, into Roman citizenship, indicating that his parents were likely Roman citizens. So therefore, Paul was born as a, a Roman citizen. So just as when someone becomes a citizen of the United States, as one of us recently has, doesn't mean that she's no longer from Brazil, but she is a... Roman citizen, a U.S. citizen, and if she were to have children, they would all they would be born as U.S. citizens. So Paul was born a citizen, and now this complicates the matter for the commander for Claudius Lysias. It it turns out now by this admission from Paul that his authority over Paul was only local to Jerusalem. If the matter you know, would now come before Rome, then Claudius Lysias, the commander, could be accused and found guilty of not only abusing a Roman citizenship, but uh, 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 abusing one with a higher status than his own. To be born a Roman citizen was a higher status than to have purchased that citizenship. And so when they hear that Paul was born a citizen, the soldiers back away, and Claudius Lysias is alarmed at what's just been revealed. The what's called in Latin the Lex Julia de V Publica, or Julius Caesar's Law of Public Power, stipulated that anyone who, while holding imperium or office, puts to death or flogs a Roman citizen, Contrary to his right of appeal, Paul had not been condemned. Paul had not stood trial. Uh, uh, Contrary to his right of appeal or order, any of the above mentioned things to be done or put a yoke on his neck so that he may be tortured is liable. So this meant that Claudius was liable to be held under Roman law and Roman punishment for what he had done for Paul, to Paul. Without Roman citizenship, Paul would have been tortured. And if not killed, handed back over to the Jews without any legal or physical protection. And the Jewish authorities would have condemned uh, Paul or allowed a plot to lynch him. We just see here just, just how God has worked. Even before Paul was born, this day was in mind that he would be born a citizen, his life would be saved, and all of this would be used to accomplish that Paul would come, would finally reach Rome. Paul would be, Paul would be handed back over to the Jews. But this protection as a Roman citizen 
is the means that God would use to bring Paul safely to Rome. So what can we learn from this? And how does it apply to us? So we're closing with this application. Our testimony is not about who we are. Our testimony is about what God has done. When Paul tried to resist Jesus' urging of him to leave Jerusalem, he tried to use his pre-converted exploits as reasons why the unbelieving Jews would listen to him. Well, this was naivety on Paul's part then, and it's, it's naivety, it would be naivety on our part now to think that our previous unconverted life would be what would give cause for someone to listen to us. I mean, first, we ask this question, what, what happens when a, when a famous person is regenerated or, or claims to be? You know, a Hollywood actor or a famous singer, um, such as Kanye West, which recently he had proclaimed Christianity. Um, when, if they're genuinely converted or they claim to be, does there turn out to be just this mass following of fellow stars and actors that are just saying, well, yes, we'll, we, we believe your testimony. We'll follow Jesus as well. There's not a mass following of fellow stars or you know that, that are also coming to Christ. Hardly. It's actually the opposite that's true. They 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 mock them, they ridicule them, they blackball them until that person is canceled, or they renounce their faith. And for example, Kanye West. You know, he seemed to be faithful for a while, but when it didn't bring him much accolades, he's turned back you know, to his old ways. Well, what about our family and our friends when we're converted? Are they suddenly willing to, oh, will you believe in Jesus now? Well, let me stop all of the things that I've been doing. I'll stop getting drunk. I'll stop smoking weed. I'll stop having sex because of what happened to you. Well, no. It's the opposite. Usually. There might be some. There might be one or two that believe. But usually it's a mocking, a ridiculing. Point being, and the point here, is that our testimonies, we must know that our personal testimonies do not save anyone. No one has ever been saved by anyone else's personal testimony. Never have, never will. So when we are witnesses and we do give voice to our testimony, we must be certain that it is God that is glorified and receives the glory. That we can say, this is who I was, now this is who I am, but it's not by my doing, it's only by Christ and Him alone. Don't, you know, don't, don't look to me as your gospel. I can't save you. My life can't save you. It's only God. These things that I, that, that I love now, that I used to hate, is only because of the Spirit in me, because of God's regeneration. The things that I once did that, I now, uh, that now disgust me and I can't continue in anymore, it's only because of the Spirit's work in me that God's given me a distaste for that. It's not because of anything in me, it's only Christ and Him alone. So that when our testimony is rejected, as Paul's was, that it's not really our testimony, it's not us that's being rejected, that it's Christ. There's no, because our, condemn, our, our testimonies cannot save anyone, 
And someone not believing our testimony doesn't condemn anyone. But that it's only Christ that is magnified. And so that when we, when we give that testimony and we point everything to Jesus, that it is Christ that is being rejected if they reject this, the message. We don't want anyone to reject Christ, but we also don't want any credit for anyone's salvation because that would rob God of His glory. When our witness of Christ is rejected, as Paul's was, as Stephen's was, and as Jesus's was, may we look upon those who reject Christ with the same compassion that Paul did, that Stephen did, and that Jesus did. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When they reject Christ, when they reject this message of, I once was lost. I was walking in darkness. The life that I thought was going to bring me great pleasure, the sin that I reveled in, led me only to death. But Christ shined the light of the Gospel in me, to me, that I could see that, see my sin and my need for a Savior. And now, I'm not saved because of anything that I did. I'm not saved because of anything I quit doing. I'm only saved because of Christ. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Him alone. Father God, we thank You, Lord, for Jesus. We thank You for His life, righteous. His death, sacrificial. In His resurrection, life-giving. Father, we thank You for Your Spirit that breathes life into us, that comes in to indwell us and causes us to walk in Your ways, that changes us, Lord, from the inside out. Lord, help us to know when we proclaim Christ, Lord, that we're not preaching behavior modification. Lord, but we're preaching Christ and Christ alone. Lord, salvation doesn't come from us, from anyone changing their outward actions, and that finally leads to a to justification and regeneration. But Lord, that it begins on the inside with a new heart and the Spirit that indwells us. Lord, that affects our outward actions because Your Spirit now lives in us, causes us to desire to walk in Your ways, gives us a love for the things You love and a hatred for the things You hate. Lord, give us a love for those who are still walking in darkness. Lord, let us go to them boldly with the Gospel and preach it to them in love, calling them to come to Christ. Lord, in an uncondemning way, not condemning them for their, ma- for their actions, Lord. That no one is condemned so much for their actions, but the condemnation is for a rejection of Christ. Lord, help us to proclaim Christ with joy and with urgency and with love. Lord, and may Your lost sheep hear Your voice and come to Jesus and believe. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.